This week on Hermitcraft, everyone plays decked out. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP. My name is Pixorus. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Man, there's a lot of time left in this video. Welcome to the Hermitcraft recap. Just skip back 10 seconds if you want to hear the opening credits. And yes, it's the week we've all been looking forward to, including us, because we relish a challenge. And it is going to be a challenge, both to provide adequate coverage of over 18 hours of footage, and also deal with the fact that the footage in question is all the Hermits getting used to the opening levels of the same game. The server may as well set a world border around Decked Out 2 for a while, because this game is going to be the centre of most Hermits' universe for the next few weeks. They've even got bedrooms, and a place to drop off the kids. So without further ado, let's take a look at what the heck Decked Out 2 is anyway. The direct sequel to a game Tango Tech created in Hermitcraft Season 7, mechanically Decked Out 2 is a custom adventure map made in survival Minecraft using redstone and custom models and sounds. But whatever, good luck! Thanks, weirdly sounding Tango! It doesn't use any cheats or content mods to run itself, though it definitely requires a lot of maintenance to run properly. Especially with how often the server mates are already breaking it. So, it's, it's everything's good. good. You fixed it with your amazing redstone skills, right? It's over. I mean, I put it back what Cancel I the project. Wrong, I wanted Can to it. make sure because my <laughs> done here. Yeah. If it seems we're avoiding the term minigame, it's because nothing here is mini. If anything, it's a maxi game. It's a decked out world, we're just living in it. And also dying in it. Gameplay wise, this is a roguelike, or even a rogue light. You're expected to run the same levels over and over, where dying is fully expected and helps you learn the layout of the level, and winning brings better tools to win harder on the next run. Remember Dead Cells? Well, this is Dead Guys. It's Hades, with less sexy voice acting. It's a pacifist run of Enter the Gungeon. It's Slay the Spire, but like, downwards. That's Wish me very luck! Cool. Wish me luck! Bye! Bye! Bye. Good luck, Scar! Bye! I'll, I'll clean up your corpse on the inside! No. Players begin each run with a compass pointing towards one of several blocks hidden throughout the dungeon. Once they locate the block, tossing the compass onto the ground will dispense an artifact, make it to the exit alive, and submit your artifact to the chute, and it will be exchanged for a number of Frost Embers, a special currency that allows you to buy cards to add to your deck. Yes! Yes, baby! Yes! Nice! We did it! These cards will activate during the playthrough, applying effects and augments to the given run. Some are activated at the beginning of the run, but most are drawn by the system randomly throughout play. Frost Embers are also how the players can win the game in the very end, by buying victory tomes in the shop and thus scoring higher than their friends. Oh no! That door is timed. So we know na that now. There is a second currency appearing randomly throughout the dungeon, coins which pop up from droppers hidden in the floor. These coins can be exchanged for crowns, which are used to buy even more equipment from a shop outside the dungeon. But the player had better not wander the premises for long, because for one, the halls are patrolled by live ravagers and later wardens, but also as the game progresses, an invisible counter called Hazard will begin to lock out certain passages and activate traps throughout the level. One can't be too hasty either. The more noise you make, the higher the other counter, Clank, counts up. Clank is the heartbeat you hear in the background as hermits are playing. The faster the heartbeat gets, the more dangerous the dungeon becomes, as more viewing windows open for the beasts to spot the player, as well as more monsters becoming active from behind the walls. Oh, okay, if I just stop at any moment, I'm going to get uh, done by little ghosty goose. Let's go. This, mind you, is on top of the already present difficulty setting in the beginning of the game. Luckily, some cards can temporarily prevent Clank and Hazard from happening, and there's certainly more to either mechanic, different difficulty levels, lower level keys, and also the final, secret level, unlocked only by communally spotting every easter egg Tango hid across the game. But this is the shortest explanation we could come up with that would make what we're about to tell you make any sense. If you want the full tutorial, the description of this video has a link to a full explanation by Tango himself. And if you want to see how any of this was accomplished in Survival Minecraft, we highly recommend going back and watching everything Tango has ever done, because it all feels like it was building to this moment. It may be his greatest achievement in Minecraft, which is pretty incredible considering he was the godfather of survival iron farms, once wrote a mod that completely overhauls villagers, and also made Decked Out 1. But now we've attempted to explain what this whole thing is, let's talk about the people who actually played it. 
Starting with Etho, who was crowned the champion of Decked Out 1, so those are probably his crowns Tango is giving out as currency now. Etho sacrifices some good Canadian weather to step into the dungeon and be judged by everybody, but he makes good on his reputation and makes it out successfully on his first run. Tango, <laughs> pull my place. You guys are gonna understand the irony that when Etho plays, he wins and I die. <laughs> <laughs> he just killed the dungeon master. <laughs> That's awesome. The second run seems determined to dunk on him though, when he gets hit by random vexes and a door literally slams in his face. Hey! <laughs> I wanted to go in there! Oh, come on, man! I wanted to explore! His strategy so far is to get a few more wins under his belt and build a more powerful deck for future weeks, but in the meantime, he invents a pretty successful quiz show format for players waiting in the queue. What block would be the meanest thing to describe Green's personality? Grian has the personality of a, a wet sponge. <laughs> the queue even has a visual representation thanks to a system Etho and Impulse SV cook up together. A set of armor stands is recycled using a water stream to indicate who's next in line once everybody crowds into the waiting room. Impulse is no stranger to queuing systems, of course, installing upgrades to the ticket booths at Scarland this week. Some not sinister at all clockwork looking ticket takers have been delivered by the server's model maker, and Impulse immediately Five Nights at Freddy's himself, a zombie, and finally some armor stands. Uh, let me see, if I actually put this on myself, <laughs> let's see what it looks like. Oh my gosh, oh yeah, this is just all sorts of, all sorts of, of, of wrong. <laughs> Good Times with Scar actually performs a full showcase of the park's various armor stands, including Grandma Good Times with real sitting action. This scene is an homage to my great grandma who loved Disneyland, but only enjoyed sitting on a bench, watching people or riding the people mover over and over. But it's a small world after all. And as we mentioned, the world is shrinking to the size of the Frost Citadel this week, so Impulse throws himself into the dungeon, which of course involves shaving his beard off in the process. His two on-camera runs go remarkably well, despite Tango having to remind him that you don't slam dunk your compass into the nearest wall. From what we've heard afterwards though, the game dunked on him during his later live streams, so I guess what goes around comes around. Scar, in the meantime, is going around this one frozen puddle in the dungeon, trying and failing to locate the exact block his compass needs to go in to give him the artifact. All that work. All that work. All that work. Tango is a super hockey player, and he loves curling. And this is how you do it, guys. What? Boom. Look at it, look at it, look at it, look, come on, let's go! No! I'm so sad right now. His ice capades are rewarded ultimately when at the very end of this, Scar is able to buy a victory tome with the embers he made. Too bad he's too eager to throw the money at it, since you're actually supposed to put it into the shulker box under whatever you want to buy. I have been robbed and I have been wronged. Naturally, if there are going to be some teething problems with Decked Out, the players are going to be the ones to throw a potato in the works. Or in the case of Doc M, throw himself into it. After his first successful run, which is the one after he gets Ravaged trying to find the entrance to level 2, Doc redeems his artifact, stands on the Frost Ember dispensing trapdoor, and gets flushed through it into the bubble column. At least Tango gets a funny screenshot before busting out the toolbox to break him out. We have a winner, folks! <laughs> Tango, I trapped! <laughs> You know, Doc, when I built this, I said to myself, surely no one will fall in the, the trap door. Surely. I was, I was looking downstairs. <laughs> one Doc is one of the many participants who decorated his alcove of the decked out foyer this week, and it must have come as a welcome break from decorating the walls of the perimeter. He's moved on to the foundations of the walls now that three of the four sides have a huge stripe of sandstone and copper adorning the top edge, although I'm not sure how he expects his copper to age when the whole point of the perimeter is standing at least 128 blocks away from anything else. It's pretty much hours of art and hours of work in many, many cases. Azumavoid actually changes up his approach to creating oxidized copper. You know how nowadays he gets all his teal blocks by automatically spreading them five blocks apart over a large area? Well, here's a new concept. What if he didn't? It turns out the mechanic of oxidized copper helping nearby copper oxidize faster is much more powerful than we ever expected, and to the AFKing bunch it is actually more efficient to put a slab of fresh metal over the sheet of the greened up one. Though there's no time to spend waiting for the blocks to change, what with the siren call of a fresh minigame, and X sets out for Decked Out to go find his own electric guitar. Oh! Oh! No! I'm totally pinned! 
It's worth pointing out that all the artifacts in the game are dedicated to the Hermitcraft members and their personas, so it's pretty cute when a player gets the item dedicated to them. For example, Hypnotized has his own bandana dispensed to him at one point, though he is too preoccupied with surviving through the encounter to react. Oh, I might have just made a mistake. The Ravager close calls did leave enough of an impression, however, that Hypno decided to stash away a couple of spare pants in his personal deck display room, which, funnily enough, made the whole thing kind of look like a chicken face. Slightly, I'm gonna have to take care of those blocks up there because that's a little bit glaring. Don't tell Tingo. I, I know somebody out there is gonna snitch. Don't tell Tingo. Otherwise, he's been going through the game as if there is a major league decked out he's trying to get to which is actually good for everyone involved, since exploring the place is how the group will ultimately unlock the final level. As such, Hypno is one of the few people who already found an easter egg and noted what block it was sitting on, a miniature Joe Hills stashed away behind some jumping. What is- oh, Tango, 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 what is this? Ooh! Although the absolute first easter egg of the season was found by Cubfan135 in a secret entrance behind a powdered snow wall. Hey Bale, B dubs. Hey Bale, B dubs. Hey Bale, B dubs. Oh. No. I found, I found an Easter egg. You did yes. not. I did. I did. Woo! Let's go first Easter egg. And there was another incredible first. Cub had the dubious honor of being the first to be killed by the mimic chest. You know the one. If you don't know, don't worry about it. Just saw what happened to you, my son, my friend. Oh, the genius. <laughs> that. Bravo. Is for your, that is for your secrecy. <laughs> His win to death ratio is well catalogued within the personal speed demon dojo Cub converted his deck display into. Not only writing down the numbers, but also attaching a small description of each run to help work out the strategy. So far the strategy is not to get crammed between three ravages at once. Oh, level two, I'm, in the, I'm on the wrong level. The full size Joe Hills also discovers a piece of himself when he tracks down the Tome of the Hills on one of his later attempts at the dungeon. Thankfully, it's not the one where he entered wearing his usual suit of armor and elytra, and he's not the only one to lose a set of wings in the frozen caves. Joe tackles decked out with the same enthusiasm he has for his tropical fish fountain. The guppy geyser, having been revived in his decked out dressing room last week, goes through several more shulkers of tropical fish just because everyone has been hanging out here often enough. In fact, Decked Out has become a place you can guarantee most everyone on the server will swing by, so Joe seizes the opportunity to drop off several shulkers of sand to help with Doc M's perimeter decorations. Apparently he needs a bunch of sand for the perimeter, and I had suggested he could ask hermits to collect sand while they waited in line for Decked Out. I should go gather some sand and do that now. In a hilarious bit of synergy, Grian too finds several shulker boxes relevant to Doc's perimeter, several shulker boxes of dirt. Quite surprising they had any left after the project, or any on the server for that matter, but I guess when in Rome build all the roads that lead there, and Grian uses the turf to cover up some holes they had laying around in their base cluster. Our man actually had a hand in launching decked out on time, or rather it cost him an arm and a leg to help Tango lure all the wardens to the game area. It later proves quite the challenge to lure him out of the game area too, but luckily the Ravagers take care of that pretty quickly. Nope, 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 I didn't. Right. Three and the exit is at the entrance. Yeah, but I don't know where the entrance is, Tango! But the biggest influence here, perhaps, is not what Grian did while inside the dungeon, but right outside of it, waiting in line for his turn. Everyone was getting quite chummy around the event, so he figured might as well make a game out of it. A spare wall in the lobby was dug up into a larger room where the gang put a stage and played more or less Jeopardy. Clearly, the giant custom-built adventure map Tango spent most of the season building is overkill, given that the cast is here entertaining themselves with just an empty room. Type of mob. I'm gonna say skeleton horse. <laughs> That's flabbergasted. <laughs> These guys don't know how to play this game! Yeah. Just as funny is the deck display room Grian carved out for himself. Clearly having gotten the palette by stretching himself horizontally in Microsoft Paint, he wallpapered the wall into a sort of Grian pride flag. And yet, if we combine this widest Grian body room with Zedaf's one that's pretty much just his head, we can assemble one functional decked out player. And Zedaf is certainly a functional player, having playtested the game far and wide pretty much throughout the whole of development. He's not here to score easy points though, he's here to score easy shots. Aiming to complete his spying on Hermit's advancement, Zed plops himself in a few key points of the dungeon in secret nooks and crannies, armed with a spyglass and ready to take pictures for his friend folder. Heck, he's spawn camping them at one point, sniping from right in front of the dungeon entrance. 
<laughs> I have these creepy little eyes that no one will ever, ever see that. B00 completes the trio of players who really want to uh, personalize their alcoves significantly, then goes in to face decked out head on. But Death for entertainment glory. reasons, I should do level Death two. Go for glory? I don't even know how to leave yet. Given that each player has enough frost shards to enter the dungeon 10 times in this opening week, B-Dubs puts them all into a single video, give or take a couple of shards he's handed under the table by Tango for helping out with the interior decorations. His plan is actually to swap one of the giant face's teeth with a gold block every time he successfully completes a run, presumably to replace the ones that have been punched out by Ravagers. Hopefully, one, two, three, four, eleven spots. Because despite bringing in this level of confidence, B-Dubs doesn't fare too well in the early stages of the dungeon. At least his dentist will be happy. And his horses will be slow. Zidaf tracks down the horse they gifted False, Speedy Supreme, the slowest horse on the server. But not for long, since Zed is determined to breed an even slower one, and Speedy here, ironically, actually does speed up that process significantly. Zed isn't the only one horsing around, as Pearlescent Moon gets recruited by Gemini Tay to help with a path from their base area to Decked Out, and the third member of the soup group turns up to immediately test the paths under the hooves of his mighty steed. See, now we all need horses <laughs> so we can gallop soon. together. Make soup horse. <laughs> well, this is kind of a soup horse. Noodles! Ah, oh, that's adorable! <laughs> this path naturally leads to Pearl's first Decked Out run, egged on by her companions, and she discovers another four-legged animal you don't want to be trampled by. Please don't be down here. Ah! No! I need to go in there! I need to go in there. Uh. Oh, oh, hi. Well, this is a... <laughs> ah, no! <laughs> we wish Pearl the best of luck with the Ravagers in the near future. We wish the same increase of luck for Stress Monster, who finds that the cautious approach to the dungeon isn't always the safest one. She maybe listens too hard to the voice announcing Sneak, and despite her best efforts, runs afoul of the beasts of the labyrinth in a variety of tight corners and inescapable situations. My god, it's not that hard to not break bushes! No! Wait! <laughs> There's lava everywhere! There's another one there! <laughs> it's the same one! But Stress is also one of the many players who find themselves drawn to the keys which unlock level 2 of the dungeon, even if she doesn't need to be there quite yet. So perhaps scouting ahead like this will create an advantage as her deck ramps up for future challenges. One more time. Please let me win this time. Zombie Cleo's deck room is actually very reminiscent of Gemini Tay's base, and it's no wonder that after their time in the ringer they'd want a zen garden nearby. Nah. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> Don't kill the messenger! <laughs> you suck! Your game sucks! <laughs> that being said, Cleo both collected their first artifact and made it to the gift shop at the end on the first try. Okay, uh, my brain has switched off all memory of where I am. Oh no. iJevin's separate bid to avoiding the Ravagers was to dress up like their Wrangler. Little did that do since the beasts are perfectly fine snacking on Tango too. Still, Jevin gives the levels of the game his biggest explore, and even gets one of the Ravagers stuck on terrain at some point, even if just so it can watch him die on some magma blocks shortly after. Okay, that guy cannot move. Oh no. Oh, I'm so dead. Yep, saw that coming. And to his credit, Jevin dedicates an entire video to mapping out the second level, which probably had something to contribute to this tweet by Tango Tech. With all the excitement around Decked Out 2 opening its doors, one could easily forget that there are other games still to play on the server. XB Crafted ends the official competition for Ore Spy, awarding the prize money to iJevin, but encourages Jev to sign up for third degree in the process, if only to ask Cub Van some awkward questions. And say it's Cub Van. I can ask him if he's pooped his pants? Exactly. Oh, I gotta sign up. Right. I mean, nobody was stopping you before, but I guess that's the point of the game. You could have asked him at his museum opening, which we mention mostly because XB shows up to that in his video and includes footage of B00 getting Night at the Museum. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> XB also shows up to claim a decked out booth, but his attempts at the dungeon haven't appeared in videos or on stream at the time of this recording. Decked out runs have also temporarily paused the other game makers in their work, with Stress and Iskel taking a break from designing 20 Ways to Fail, and Vintage Beef's TCG Battle Royale taking a backseat to seeing what the new card-based game on the block is all about. Beef is among the many players slightly confused by his first compass location, but luckily Tango is there to nudge him in the right direction, which is downward. 
this compass couldn't have been any further away this point oh wait a minute wait a minute not good okay maybe it's right below Tango is also there to face Palm and offer some gentle corrections when Beef exits the dungeon without spending his Frost Embers, on the assumption he could save them for a more expensive card. Some of Beef's later attempts go well, and he's able to buy a rare Tactical Approach card, which lets him poke around a little more, but unfortunately doesn't help him avoid the Ravages. Yes! Oh, I have four cards now, this is exciting. Uh-oh, I'm trapped in here. I'm trapped in here! Oh no. Oh no. In fact, Iskal's latest games being designed around failure might trick you into thinking he's doomed in the dungeon. And at first you might be right. At least Azuma is also up early to hang around and share in the Schadenfreude as the two of them deal with wall hacking ravages and getting pinned in awkward corners. Exuma? Hello? I am talking. Excuse me? Hello? Exuma? But by his next episode, Iskal has settled on a speedrunning strategy, whipping through the dungeon before it has time to penalize him for taking too long. And while ramping up the difficulty doesn't quite go his way, he's started to build a deck that will eventually make him more powerful. Which is good, because the ice caves contain a lot of his personal kryptonite. Shame to he who gives up. Woo, I'm sorry, Tango. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And finally, there's Rendog, who presents his first look at Decked Out unedited, which means he has to leave in something he admits, and we agree, is probably the most unfortunate Decked Out run of all. Uh, Listen, I'm trying to... Is it, is it not obvious I'm trying to delay the inevitable here? I don't want to go in there. I, I, it's, I want to go build something. Bye. This is scary. No, you don't. You really don't. This is so much fun. First, he gets an introduction to the dungeon, a sound check, and a tour of the daycare facility, courtesy of Zombie Cleo, who is just there to enjoy people's reactions between recording intros and outros. But when Ren finally steps into the dungeon, he does it with gusto, and with his Frostwalker boots still on. While you'd think that was an advantage in an ice cave, what transpires is more unlucky than the average Ravager encounter, and poor Ren has nobody to blame but himself. No, it doesn't seem like it's down there. Can we breathe? Is there any breathing holes here? Oh no! 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 The breath! The breath! No, we forgot to breathe! No! <laughs> Still, a couple more runs turn out much more successful, and at least the other adventurers can let him know where his spare sunglasses went. Cleo, mm -hmm. I did it. I got it. I found the artifact. I found I an artifact. It. And that's about it for this week's recap. For real this time, my name is Pixel Rivs, our writer is Loy XP, and captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.